joining us today. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our latest installment of our New England Innovate series. Over the years since we first launched this series, we've had some great discussions and a wide range of topics ranging from FinTech to cybersecurity, and just last fall, innovation in the medical field to combat Alzheimer's disease. Today, we're excited to be taking a deep dive into the blue economy and to learn more about how businesses and institutions in New England are driving marine technology and innovation. I want to extend, extend my sincere thanks to our friends here once again uh, at the New England Aquarium for graciously hosting us here at this beautiful waterfront venue. Uh, if you were here, I say, uh, over the weekend, as one of my neighbors was, they said it was absolutely magnificent uh, yesterday. So it's a uh, beautiful, beautiful venue. We're honored to be joined by the aquarium CEO, Vicki Spurl, who I will introduce in just a moment. I'd like to say a very special thanks to her team, James Sutherland and Alicia Weidman, on her team who have been, I guess the words we want to use, uh, helpful, incredibly helpful in the planning. I would also give a shout out to our own New England Council, uh, Emily Heisig, as well as Mar uh, Maria, uh, Mariah uh, Healy, uh, to say the least. These two individuals did a great job as well. Speaking of thank yous, I want to thank the team at MITRE Corporation, who played a role in shaping today's event. Doug Robbins, who is here, a board member from MITRE, will be moderating the panel discussion later this afternoon. Special thanks to our tech and innovation working group co-chairs, Katie Yunos of MITRE and Joe Donovan of Donovan Strategies for their support in making today's event happen. Before I hand it over to Vicki to introduce our keynote speaker, I wanted to take a moment to remind you of a few upcoming New England Council events. Looking forward to our first program with the Commonwealth's new Attorney General, Andrea Campbell, later this month. We have a very busy fall planned. We will welcome four members of the New England uh, Congressional Delegation at Capitol Hill uh, breakfast events, uh, including Representative uh, Lori Trahan, Representative Jake Auchincloss, Representative uh, Jeff Moulton, and Minority Whip Catherine Clark. We also have scheduled uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island and the newly elected member uh, of Congress for the state of Vermont, uh, Becca Balin will be speaking to the New England Council. We wrap up the month of October with our 2023 annual celebration on October 26th at the Omni Hotel here in the Seaport area, where we have at the present time 167 tables sold. Ira Jackson's talking to himself because he was the chair of the New England Council when we had 68 tables. And he's saying, wait a minute, you have 167 tables sold and we still have a few weeks to go. So uh, as always, you can find more information and register for all our upcoming events on our website, newenglandcouncil.com. Again, I thank all of you for being here this afternoon, and I'm pleased to introduce Vicki Spruill, the CEO of the New England Aquarium. Good morning, everyone, and thanks, Jim. We also love our partnership with the New England Council, and thank you for your amazing team as well. Um, on behalf of the New England Aquarium, I want to welcome all of you here on this perfect New England day. Um, you know, it just, I think it's a good thing we're made of hardy stock because we have more of these days than the other kind. Um, I also have just a slight programming change. Our chief scientist and head of our Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life, our research arm here at the aquarium, didn't want to come and, sh and spread any uh, or share any germs. So our panel will be minus one person today, but he's here in spirit. So the irony isn't lost on me that this event was originally rescheduled because of an unexpected spring storm. And now it's occurring right in the middle of hurricane season. And while we definitely felt some impact here in Massachusetts, 
at least right here in Boston, we were prepared and it wasn't so bad. But if you look out here, you can see the height of the water. It's not usually quite like this. I think it's why it makes this conversation today especially important and timely. I'm really inspired to see so many different leaders from across the economy, our New England economy gathered here today um, for a robust conversation that is around an issue that's certainly near and dear to our hearts, and that's responsible growth of the blue economy here in our region. And how can we find ways to collaborate on really uh, innovative solutions? Before introducing our esteemed speaker, I want to quickly share why this topic in particular is central to the aquarium's mission. We are a 54-year-old ocean conservation organization. The New England Aquarium's vision is, of course, to ensure a vital and vibrant ocean for, future, for generations to come. We safeguard threatened species and their habitats both here in our care. How many of you have visited the New England Aquarium? It's my favorite thing to do because it's the only job I've ever had where everybody raises their hands. <laughs> But we care for those animals out in the wild as well. And critically, we promote the responsible growth of our blue economy um, from our research at the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life, our work with policymakers, and our newest Balanced Blue Lab, which works with ocean industries to promote ocean friendly practices. Here in Massachusetts, the blue economy is booming growing 38% between 2009 and 2019, and employing over 100,000 individuals across 6,000 businesses. There's a clear opportunity, and I would say a responsibility, to collaborate and ensure that the use of our coastal resources is balanced with conserving endangered species and ecosystems that support our local communities. Thankfully, we have one of the strongest partners in this work, in the, in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. I was in DC too long and I used the acronyms and forget what the real thing words are. Under the leadership of Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and the 11th NOAA Administrator, Dr. Richard Stinrad. He has helped accelerate and guide the development of this rapidly growing sector. In his capacity as NOAA Administrator, Dr. Spinrad is responsible for the strategic oversight and direction of this critically important agency, helping guide and shape NOAA's portfolio of products and services to better address the climate crisis, enhance environmental sustainability, foster economic development, and create a more just, <laughs> I hate when I do this, equitable and diverse workforce for tomorrow. We at the New England Aquarium are honored to work closely with our administrator on just some of these critical issues. Dr. Spinrad has always been a champion for our oceans, most recently serving as a professor of oceanography and vice president for research at Oregon State University. Previously, Dr. Spinrad also served as NOAA's chief scientist under former President Barack Obama and led NOAA's Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research and National Ocean Service. His list of accomplishments is immense, including successfully co-leading the White House Committee that developed the nation's first set of ocean research priorities. I could continue on and on about how NOAA and its work is invaluable to all of us here today, but I know you're all looking forward to hearing from Administrator Spinrad himself and his thoughts on the importance and promise of the blue economy. So with that, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Spinrad and welcome him to share his remarks. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Jim. Uh, what a great NOAA day, huh? As forecast, keep that in mind. Make sure everybody understands that. I, I also point out, as you've already heard, this is actually rescheduled from uh, March when we also had an, as forecast, late winter storm. 
And uh, I also realized in talking with a number of folks that uh, the New England Council had invited Senator Markey to talk about climate a while back, and it was one of the hottest days here in Boston. You had to roll up the, the, the windows here, and everybody was dying from the heat. So you have Senator Markey come in, and you have biblical heat. You have the no administrator come in and you have biblical floods. What's next on the climate agenda here? But I'm not here to talk about the weather. Uh, I want to talk about an issue that is, I think, uh, very important, especially for the commercial sector, for business in general. And I've got to say, personally, it's a real special treat to be back here at the New England Aquarium. I started my career as an oceanographer. I, I decided I was going to be an oceanographer in eighth grade. Uh, and I ended up as an undergraduate at Johns Hopkins University studying earth and planetary sciences under the direction of a very junior, very young assistant pre professor named Barry Schubel, uh, who was my mentor early on in my career. Those of you who don't know, uh, Jerry had the job as director here uh, probably about 20, 25 years ago and then went on to uh, lead the uh, aquarium out of uh, the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. So. For me, there's a special connection for my own passion for the oceans and the work that's done here at uh, the New England Aquarium. And what I'm going to talk about, I think you'll understand why the more than a million visitors that come through this aquarium are a very useful tool in understanding what the new blue economy is about. And so I'm going to focus my comments on terms and ideas that I think any one of the visitors going through the aquarium today or any day could easily understand because basically at the end of the day, the concepts of the new blue economy are fundamental to our lives, our livelihoods, our lifestyle. It's a way of thinking about economics and the ocean that really reframes, I think, our relationship uh, with the ocean and demonstrates most effectively that we can, in fact, balance environmental stewardship. Think of things like establishing marine protected areas and economic development. These are not mutually exclusive. They actually ratchet each other up when done right. So perhaps it would be best if I start by giving you something of a definition of what I mean by the new blue economy. For me, the new blue economy is a knowledge-based economy, looking to the sea, not for the extraction of material goods, but for data and information to address societal changes and to inspire their solutions. A lot of times I ask people to think about commercial weather. So almost all of you ha have a uh, smartphone in your pocket. And on those smartphones are probably two or three or more weather apps, some of which you are actually paying money for. That is an example of an information-based economy. What's it worth to you to know when this storm is going to end? Similarly. What's it worth to you to know something about the ocean? What is a bit of information about the ocean worth to you? And how are we going to get that information? So while the new blue economy is a future endeavor, it's really already underway. When I used to work for the US Navy, we had something called optimal track ship routing. That's basically the new blue economy. It's the way the Navy, using its own classified systems, gets information to determine what's the optimal way to move that battle group from point A to point B. What's the optimal way for that submarine to transit in the ocean? Now think about shipments. Think about all of the transit, all of the commerce going out of the Port of Boston. Example I like to use, I came from Oregon for this job, and in the Port of Portland in Oregon, which is mostly a port that ships grain, you have to know how much to load out on that ship that's going out to sea. Now, the transit from the port of Portland, Oregon, to Asia or South America requires first that you actually go under 12 bridges. You also want to make sure that you're clearing the bottom. You don't want your ship to run aground. You want to optimize the below keel clearance. Oh, by the way, it rains a lot in Oregon, which means the freshwater content of that river and that bay is going to vary, which means your buoyancy is going to vary. It's also tidally influenced. For any of the scientists in the audience, you know, I just gave you a many-variable problem. How do you take data 
in a way that you can predict how much to load out that ship so that you can tell the grain shippers, if you're leaving next Tuesday, you can take another 100 tons of grain as long as you leave between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. Because we know it's not going to rain. You're going to have the right buoyancy. You can clear the bridges and you won't run aground. You'll reach the maximum of the tidal cycle. You think about the value of the new blue economy and doing things like natural damage assessment. In the case of the Deepwater Horizon, where we had a lot of damage to the sediments and a lot of damage to the flora and fauna on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, we didn't know how much damage because we did not have the data that told us what the conditions were before the oil spill. So having that baseline environmental information has value, actual has financial value. And it's because of technological advances that we've made in the last few years that we can actually do these kinds of things. We can start understanding the way the ocean is behaving. We can translate, translate that to what I like to call environmental intelligence. The factors that a business can use to make decisions, the facts, factors that an emergency manager can use to make decisions, the factors that an individual can use to make a decision. If I could give you a very accurate forecast, for example, of when the harmful algal blooms, red tides, as the press likes to call them, were going to happen, how valuable is that? How valuable is that to the tourism industry? How valuable is that to the health industry? I'll share with you a story from 20 years ago when I was the head of the National Ocean Service. We actually developed a harmful algal bloom forecast system. HABs, we call them, HAB forecast system for the eastern Gulf of Mexico. And I decided to take it, we didn't have any way of getting it out to people. But I decided to take it to, first I decided to take it to the local tourism industry and the local health community. I wasn't sure they would like it. They loved it. They said, sure, if we can pre-mobilize for an event, and basically these harmful algal blooms emit aerosols which, when blown on shore, cause respiratory problems or exacerbate already existing respiratory problems. So you bet the public health community said, we want that information. We'd love to have a lead time on when we're going to see a, a HABs bloom. Similarly, the tourism industry said, yeah, if we know we can tell that family that's coming to Tampa for a vacation that, no, nah, you don't want to go to the beach tomorrow. You might want to go over to Epcot Center or something like that. How much is that worth? The answer is, it's worth a lot. At NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, I would argue that we have a unique role to play, the same way we have a unique role to play with respect to weather. We are the federal authoritative source for weather information. We are well positioned to serve as that authoritative source for the new blue economy, the ocean information that feeds not just the immediate issues, what's going to happen here tomorrow with respect to currents and tides, how do you optimize that uh, ship traffic, but it's also long term. If you're a community planner, how are you going to know what sea level rise is going to do? What is storm surge from a hurricane like Hurricane Lee going to mean to the coast of Cape Cod, not this last week, but 20 years from now? What's it going to look like as a result of sea level rise? So having that kind of information is really our DNA. It's what we're made of at NOAA. And I would argue that in building out this new blue economy, that, that the concept is you can take our data to the bank. Literally, you can take that data, translate it to the information you want. Another favorite story I've got is that 20 years ago, we realized that we could take NOAA data and do something truly revolutionary with it. We could put it out on, you ready for this? The web. We could put NOAA data out on the web. Now, this was 20 years ago. This was new thinking. As soon as we announced we were going to do this, I get a phone call from a guy in Florida. He says he's going to sue us. I said, why are you going to sue us? He said, well, you're competing with the private sector. I said, how do you figure that? He said, well, I've got a business where I take government data, I put it behind a firewall on the web, and I charge people money. I said, that's your business model? He said, yeah. I said, sue away. Won't hold water. 
I said, unless you're doing something that is adding intellectual property, something creating new value, then we're not really competing with you. To his credit, the guy started a business. First, he had to figure out what's the market. And he realized there was a market out there that was the recreational sport fishing tournament industry. And he believed he could create a product where he derived information to predict what the sea surface temperatures were going to look like. And many of these target species for this tournament industry respond to sea surface temperature. The end of this story is he created a niche market, and he's had a successful business working that for the last 20 years. That is the new blue economy. He's not bending one piece of metal. He's not creating a single tangible object. He's creating knowledge. He's creating intelligence. And the special sauce was the intellectual proper new blue economy, unless we know what the standards are. If you want to say, yes, we're going to do environmental DNA, to what standard? What are the metrics that are going to allow you to sell your products effectively because you have assured these are authoritative? And the one that I'm most excited about right now is the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Why I'm excited about that? I had a conversation with Kathy Vidal, the head of PTO, a while ago. She said to me, you know, Rick, I've got a problem. None of my patent examiners know anything about climate change or the science of climate change. And I said, that's interesting, Kathy, because none of my scientists know anything about intellectual property. So we have now started a program. We actually, I call it the prisoner exchange. We've sent people from PTO and people from NOAA to each of the other agencies to talk about exactly that. So that now, if anybody in this audience says, I have an idea, I think I can build a market around product X. We've set up a way where we at NOAA can say, you know, we can actually provide you with the raw material, the data, to help build that product, and we can also help you determine if you've got protectable intellectual property, because at the end of the day, your business model is going to depend on that. So I am particularly excited about the relationship between building out the new blue economy and what's going to happen in intellectual property through the offices of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. The, the partnerships are only going to, go, going to grow. Uh, we spent a lot of uh, our investment with uh, academia. I've spent a lot of time in my career working with the Marine Technology Society. The numbers of businesses that are starting up in this space blows my mind. And here's the real interesting thing. I used to I regularly go to a conference called Oceanology International. When you walk the floor of Oceanology International, as I have for years and years, easily 90% of the vendors on the exhibit floor were selling you a thing. They were selling you a new sensor. They were selling you what we would call a new platform, like an, a, a drone, an autonomous vehicle. Last year, I did an informal survey. 40%, 40% of those exhibitors were selling data as a service. You can buy anything from them that you could put your hands on. They're selling data as a service. Industry is smart. They have seen the opportunity here. You don't sell data unless you see somebody being able to monetize, commercialize that to good end. So I am very excited about all of these things. The, the MITRE Blue Tech Lab, as an example, Doug, is exactly demonstrative of the kinds of things that we want to do. We want to see industry pushing the limit on what is the art of the possible, what are the products and services, what are the capabilities that blend knowledge about the environment as seen 20 yards away here in the aquarium with an understanding of economic opportunity. So as you can see, I feel pretty strongly that the new blue economy is both a real thing and is something for which we will not, we don't know what the full potential of it is. But I'm here to tell you that as long as I am the NOAA administrator, which will hopefully be five more years, we will see this market emerge and we will see some incredible applications in every single economic sector you can imagine manufacturing, transportation 
agriculture, energy, commerce. And so I want to make sure, if you haven't heard me or anyone else talk about the new economy before, that you're hearing it first from me here today. And I hope you hold me accountable so the next time I come back here, you can ask me what's different, what's new, what will NOAA bring to the table to help stimulate this economy. And again, I couldn't be more excited about being able to share this insight with you. It's a very real thing. And ask for your help because we can't do it alone. We will use your tax dollars as effectively as we possibly can. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on where the art of the potential is. And with that, thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. We have time for maybe uh, two or three minutes. I could ask questions, but I'd rather have an opportunity for you to ask your questions. So if someone wants to raise their hand and ask a question, feel free. Identify yourself, too, please. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Spinrad. Roger Stevenson, a Union of Concerned Scientists. You um, say you can bring the data to the bank. I want to talk about some counterfeit currency, and that's disinformation with respect to, well, including uh, the myth of impact of offshore wind and whale mortality. What can NOAA do? Because there is no evidence. And what can we do to help NOAA battle that disinformation? Yeah, thank you. Because the issue of disinformation is particularly insidious. We've always had it, but I think now uh, the American public is sometimes confused because they have access to a lot of information. Uh, so there are two thoughts that I have. One is that we will continue to work hard to make sure that we get the best scientific information translated and into the hands of decision makers that we introduce it in the appropriate forums, um, which means I've pushed very hard for a number of um, scientific integrity applications. We have a scientific integrity uh, policy, which I think is rather strong. UCS has actually helped us develop that in years past. But the other thing is I think we need, we need to educate people on uncertainty because there is not a scientific um, perspective that doesn't have some uncertainty associated with it. Uh, even though, in the example you've cited, uh, we have no evidence that suggests that any of the offshore wind activities uh, directly tied to any of the aspects of unusual uh, mass mortality events for marine mammals. But there's always a little bit of uncertainty in there. How do we characterize that when we talk to people? So there's an educational effort that needs to be picked up in terms of people understanding what uncertainty means. It's like telling people there's an 80% chance of rain in Boston today. Make sure people understand that. So I would say communicate as effectively as you can as every, at every scientific level that we can, and then also build better concepts for sharing uncertainty, which is, oh, by the way, why we're spending a lot of our time with social, behavioral, and economic scientists, including working with the National Science Foundation, who has more resources to study these kinds of things. Thank you for that question. Question and then we have to move on to the panel. But you were so kind in coming here, and with the weather being it is, I thought it'd be nice to have you have an opportunity. Quick, Joe Donovan. Quick question, Joe. I got a dinner to go to tonight. Administrator Spinneret, thank you very much, and thanks to the council for hosting this. Can you talk about the role that autonomous systems and artificial intelligence have with NOAA? And we know that that could take uh, a lot of time, but appreciate your comments. Thanks. I'll start by saying all of my prepared remarks today were prepared by ChatGPT. So um, autonomous systems and AI, first of all, I am all for them. Um, as a scientist, I'm fascinated. We're already using autonomous systems extensively operationally. In fact, for Hurricane Lee, we launched drones from our airplanes to provide low-level observations where it would be unsafe to make observations with our P3s. So we use uh, autonomous systems uh, in the ocean as well to do a number of uh, hydrographic survey, mapping and charting efforts. We actually use airborne drones to collect samples from whales. We call it the snot bot to collect samples so we can understand the health of these animals. So there's many places uh, where we're using autonomous systems. We will be using more. Tomorrow I'll be going up to UNH to see what they're doing with respect to use of autonomous systems. 
Uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning are already part of our agenda. There are um, important efforts looking at how AI will improve our weather forecasting capability. I am actually pushing hard for the use of generative AI on things like establishing policies for phishing, at least the first drafts of those policies, or in responding to rules where we may get 80 or 90,000 public comments. But we have to be careful. There's a downside to artificial intelligence. Fortunately, the government, uh, writ large, the federal government, is trying to establish swim lanes, guide rails for how we will use AI. But again, I think five years from now, AI and machine learning will be uh, tools that are readily being used throughout the federal government. Thank you. With that, we want to thank uh, Dr. Spinrad for making the effort up to uh, Boston from Washington this afternoon, and we wish him much success in his next five years uh, as the head, uh, Noah. And uh, now I'm going to uh, invite our esteemed panelist and moderator to the stage. As I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the team at MITRE Corporation, including Megan Welford and Katie Inos, who is the co-chair of the Council's Tech and Innovation Working Group, has been very, very helpful in the planning of today's program. We're pleased that Doug Robbins, who serves on the Council Board of Directors, joining us this afternoon, moderate the panel discussion portion of the program. Many of you know he is the Vice President of Engineering and Prototyping at MITRE Labs. He leads MITRE's Innovate Innovation Center in the research, engineering, and prototyping of new solutions in the public interest. Needless to say, Doug plays a key role in helping to connect MITRE to New England's business, government, and innovation communities. In November of 2021, MITRE launched its Blue Tech Lab, a national resource for advancing undersea testing, innovation, and collaboration. So I cannot say enough of thank yous to Doug for leading today's panel discussion. Please now hand it over to him. First of all, thank you to Jim and the New England Council for creating an opportunity for industry, academia, uh, nonprofits like MITRE to come together to have important conversations uh, on, on topics like this. Of course, thank you to the New England Aquarium for this amazing venue. I don't know if Director Spinrad knew that while he, when he first mentioned shipping, there was a boat going by in the background. It was perfect timing. I don't know how you did that. Yeah, um, and, and certainly for the aquarium's uh, 58 years of dedication to uh, our, our coastal environments. Um, and, and so it's, it's great to be here with this panel and we'll get, uh, get to introducing them in just a minute. I wanted to say a little bit about MITRE. Uh, so for those not familiar, MITRE is a not-for-profit company that has a pretty uh, hard but straightforward mission and that is to solve problems for a safer world. Uh, the way we do that is we have the privilege of operating six research and development centers for the US federal government uh, we started 65 years ago with national security and today uh, work across uh, commerce, healthcare, homeland security. We work with NIST on setting standards. Um, and and across, if you look across the missions that these agencies that we support have, uh, it, you'd be hard pressed to find in some way uh, that they don't intersect uh, the new blue economy and, and our oceans. Uh, I, I, you know, sometimes I struggle for an example of where our health business or the health industry does, but thank you for a great example of the red tides. <laughs> um, and so the, the blue economy and blue technologies are super important to what we do for our agencies, and, and so we're investing in them uh, in, in capabilities to, to help the federal government. Um, uh, Administrator Spinrad mentioned our blue tech lab. Uh, we broke ground, I guess it was a year and a half, almost two years ago, and I understand from the team that this Thursday they'll start putting water in the tank. Uh, that's in, the, in Bedford, Mass. Um, it'll be a, a resource uh, for nationally, not just for us and the work we do with the agencies we support, but open to industry and academia to help fuel uh, advances in the, in the blue economy space. 
Um, we've also invested in a network we call it Blue Nerve, and it is a research network connecting institutions, uh, many that we have on the stage today, to make it easier for scientists and engineers to do their jobs, but also lower the barrier for startups and, and companies that are advancing capabilities. But with that, uh, enough about MITRE and what we're doing. I'd like to turn to our panel. Uh, so I'm joined today by Dr. Rick Murray from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Uh, let's see, you guys switch the order on me. All right, I can do it. Christopher Montferrat of General Dynamics, Dr. Diane Foster of the University of New Hampshire, and Provost Barbara Wolf from the University of Rhode Island. Great, so we'll jump right in, and we, uh, Dr. Mandelman, as mentioned before, couldn't join us. Uh, we, it would be wonderful to have him on the stage here, but I'm sure this panel will uh, help us with a robust discussion. Uh, so let's see, let's start uh, with Dr. Murray. Uh, so let's see, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is dedicated to advancing knowledge uh, of the oceans and, and how they connect the Earth system um, through sustained research, engineering, education, and then of course applying all that to really solving problems in the world. Uh, could you expand upon the new Vision 2030 that you have at, at the institution and how that intersects with the new blue economy? Yes, uh, thank you for that question, Doug, and thank you, Vicki, for running such a nice um, you know, weather notwithstanding, sorry, Rick, um, event here. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Um, just as a brief introduction, I'm the Deputy Director and Vice President for Research at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I've been there for about five years. And before that, I was a professor at Boston University for about 28 years. And the last four of that, I had the pleasure of serving the federal government at the National Science Foundation in DC, where I was the Division Director for Ocean Sciences. I've also uh, served in very local government being a um, selectman for about 10 years down in situate mass. So my answer to this question is gonna be from those several different perspectives. And they really do speak to the intersection of a so-called applied science, basic science, and the problems facing society today. The problems facing society today are quite large. Climate change, pollution, plastics, I mean, it's a long list. Academia is not gonna be the solution alone. Business is not gonna be the solution alone, and no sector is going to be the solution alone. It's going to clearly take all sectors working together. And the um, uh, spectrum from basic to applied science is becoming increasingly blurred. You mentioned the, the Blue Tech Initiative that Woods Hole and Miner are partnering with. We are just about to use your new tank, hopefully coming up for some of our uh, instrumentation that was initially developed to probe the very deepest waters of the ocean, but will also be gathering critical data about climate change. So I think that while no sector alone is going to have a solution to the big challenges facing us. We as a, and here sort of speaking from academic side as well as government side, we really need to partner more and leverage off of industry. These problems have to get to scale. We need to be able to look at things from a regional, global, and back down to local level. And the only way to really get to scale is gonna be through leveraging the great know-how of, I think, industry, both American industry and uh, overseas industry as well. So in terms of contributing to the solutions of science, it's going to take all the different sectors and we need to look beyond the applied science and basic science and realize that they are really one and the same and that we take the brain power, we take the energy, we take the the enthusiasm of youth, we take the wisdom of those of us that are more experienced and we combine it together and that's how we're gonna get to coming to solutions because we cannot wait 
there's always more data to gather before the next paper. There's always more surveys to gather before the next business decision. But we need to take action now. Awesome. Thank you, Rick. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll head over to Provost Wolf for the next uh, next question and, and for an introduction. Um, you know, as a provost of a university that is right on the water, you have a unique vantage point of what's happening in the new blue economy, and maybe to borrow some of Rick's words, that uh, uh, youthful exuberance. And so what are you seeing uh, coming out of your university in the new blue economy space, and, and what does that say for the future? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to certainly thank the New England Council for offering this event and also to the New England Aquarium for hosting this beautiful but wet uh, in, uh, environment here. Um, I have been provost since January and prior to that um, dean for six years. And what I can tell you is right now we have a very vibrant and transformation going on at the University of Rhode Island with President Perlant, who has now been with us for two years. And he, as well as many of the individuals, are huge champions of the blue economy, as you can imagine. Um, this past year, we have had a historical investment from the state of Rhode Island in the University of Rhode Island. We had over $150 million um, that has been provided in terms of upgrading our facilities of the Narragansett Bay campus. And the Narragansett Bay campus is home to our School of Oceanography and it's also home to our ocean engineering program, as well as many other majors that are involved on that campus, which as you have mentioned, is right on the bay. Um, that investment is also uh, responsible for a new pier, uh, a state-of-the-art pier that is already completed, and that is gonna be home to a new research vesicle, uh, and that's called the Narragansett John. It's a research vesicle research vesicle, which will be uh, there shortly in the next year or so. So we're very excited about that. And that is also done through a grant uh, from the National Science Foundation, which we are very appreciative with our collaborators at both UNH and Woods Hole. So I think that that's going to be a big game changer um, because when you have state-of-the-art research facilities and state-of-the-art educational facilities, that actually attracts student talent from across the globe. It also attracts faculty and it also attracts uh, state-of-the-art facilities to do new partners with uh, our industry collaborators. So we're very excited about that. Um, and that level of investment has really led to the recognition of URI as the research flagship university that's both a land grant and state and sea grant institution. And so we see that this is very, very helpful in terms of uh, achieving a destination university for looking at the blue economy. So, so those are important things. In terms of the student experience, certainly we want to educate individuals to meet the needs of the workforce. And we want to create individuals who are conscientious about how do we protect our natural resources, but also how do we contribute to a vibrant economy, and again, <clears throat> particularly relevant to the blue economy. And in that, we provide certainly looking at um, unique experiential learning opportunities that really truly prepare them in a vast array of areas, anything from fisheries to aquaculture to ocean engineering. So really having those varied opportunities that can contribute again to the workforce. And it's not just a matter of contributing to the workforce, but also partnering with our individual partners in industry to find out what are the needs, both in terms of uh, how you want your individuals to be better prepared for the jobs that you have, but also what are the scientific questions that are coming up on a daily basis that perhaps with us and our faculty, we can help provide those solutions. As it was mentioned earlier, no one's gonna have a single answer to this, and it really does create that partnership the other piece is really working with individuals, uh, the industries that our students often find jobs in the Department of Defense, Raytheon, Electric Boat, working with them, again, to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the industry so that we can contribute to that economic development. Also thinking about it, we look at our alumni as well as our faculty and what are the opportunities there. 
and we have a number of folks who have gone on to do some unique things. How do we get new companies going that contribute to the economy? Um, and we have uh, just some examples. One is called Far Sounder, which is um, a company that evolved from a faculty member and a former student that has gone on to develop technology for underwater sonar uh, that's more sensitive than perhaps others, uh, again, contributing to making sure that we are not interrupting the natural resources such as um, accidents with whales. And another company is called Juice Robotics, and that's one, again, uh, between faculty and students, um, where we have cameras that can be used for underwater exploration and that can actually tolerate various depths. So those are some of the fun things that are happening, but there's more to come. Awesome, thank you. And we will dig into the workforce topic a little bit later with, uh, with some questions for the great panel that we have. Uh, let me jump to Mr. Montferrat. Um, so question, yeah, I think some would be surprised to understand the relationship between the blue economy and the defense sector and how deep it is, and certainly General Dynamics is a part of that. You know, as, as innovations out of General Dynamics land with the Navy, the Coast Guard, uh, other maritime communities, uh, how do you uh, keep pace uh, with delivering those with the uh, this rapidly uh, growing blue economy? Well, thanks, Doug, and uh, thanks to the New England Council for hosting this event and for the aquarium for having us here. Um, a little bit of background uh, about myself. I'm Chris Montfred, the Vice President and General Manager for, oh boy, <laughs> changed my job there. Uh, Vice President of uh, Strategy and Business Development for our Maritime and Strategic Systems business. Um, I've been in the industry, in the maritime industry, for 36 years now. I'm kind of an anomaly now, a, a person who joined a company and stayed with that one company for 36 years. So, been around this business for a while. Uh, it, it means a lot to me. It means a lot to the people of our company. Um, many of you probably know uh, General Dynamics in terms of our shipbuilding capability here in New England with Bath Ironworks up in Maine, Electric Boat in Groton, and down at Quonset Point in Rhode Island. Mission Systems also has a major maritime component where we provide capability that goes onto those platforms to allow them to become uh, warfighting platforms that can accomplish the mission that they have been um, designed to accomplish. So we have uh, parts of our business that support undersea warfare, surface warfare, and strategic uh, deterrence uh, across the maritime portfolio. Um, as you can uh, imagine, with 70% of the world covered by water, um, maritime strategy is a very important factor in, in defense strategy and national defense. Uh, with the emerging threat of China and Russia, uh, that has become even more important at taking um, the vast ocean full of data, as, as we talked about earlier, and figuring out how to synthesize that data, how to collect that data better, how to get it back to uh, users, and how to turn it into information that those users can act on quickly to project power for our nation, to keep the sea lanes free for commerce. Um, so many of the, the problems that we've talked about already today are the same problems that defense is trying to tackle. How do you turn an opaque ocean? How do you build with vast data into a transparent ocean where we understand what is going on, how, how the adversaries are, are moving across the ocean, what the best lanes and paths are for uh, our fleet to move, for our, um, our forces to position. So uh, from an innovation perspective, um, you know, we invest a, a significant amount of uh, IRAD company money every year in technologies associated with the maritime domain, with the blue economy, whether it's autonomy, undersea communications, signal processing for submarines, signal processing for uh, autonomous vessels, in order to make that ocean more transparent, to get that data to the users that need it more rapidly uh, in a way that is... Um, is information versus data, as, as Dr. talked about. Uh, so that one way is our own investment. That also keeps our engineers uh, excited because they're working on cutting edge technology 
solving problems that matter today uh, with, with um, leading capabilities. The, the second way that we innovate is partnerships. And that's partnerships with labs and institutions, it's partnerships with universities, it's partnerships with small businesses. And figuring out you know, how, where the right uh, capability resides. One of the things I love about working with General Dynamics is we don't have a lot of uh, pride of ownership in terms of the best answer, right? And if we don't have the best answer, but we can help get that best answer to an, uh, a deployed state, then we're absolutely supportive of partnering when, when we can bring better capability to the nation. Um, and then the, uh, the, the final way, um, sorry, I did forget to mention, I'm probably the least educated person on the stage today, so I occasionally have to look at my notes. <laughs> um, the, the final way is our people, investing in our people. And, you know, the IRAD is one way that we keep our workforce engaged, but also um, training, providing them training, providing them opportunities to work in these partnerships, because an excited workforce for us will bring that innovation to the business uh, without us having to push it. It really needs to be um, our workforce pushing innovation, challenging the status quo, asking why you can't do something. Um, bringing ideas that wouldn't normally be in our core, bringing commercial technologies in that are um, non-standard in a military application, but figuring out how to apply them uh, to a military application. Uh, that investment pays back in spades more than almost anything else that we can do is investing in our people. Great, great, thank you. I get to cheat for the podium, so I have my notes here. Um, so let's see, uh, let, let's, let's have, head over to Dr. Foster. I think from um, ocean technology to environmental sensing, UNH has a thriving research uh, program and the momentum is building. Um, but you're also spending a lot of time working on partnerships with industry, academia, you know, government organizations. Can you, can you talk a little bit about why that's important? Certainly. Um, I'm just going to warn everybody, I was a high school cheerleader, also captain of the math team, but I get a little loud sometimes. Um, so I think that what I'd really like to do is build on my, my university colleagues. We're New Englanders, and we live in places where there are small stone walls. That means that we live next to our neighbor for generations. We know that our relationships with our neighbors are critically important. We also know that we solve problems best when we come together as a community. So I think that all of us would basically agree to that's the way we operate and we have numerous collaborations amongst us. Another thing I heard is uh, Rick mentioned basic to applied science. Many of us actually, I think, would probably describe our work as engaged science or engaged scholarship. And that means regardless of who we're partnering with, it means we've got to be really good listeners first. So before I speak to the specifics of UNH and what we do, um, I come to this from a background in mechanical engineering. I was at Ohio State as a faculty member in civil and environmental engineering for 10 years, and my husband and I wanted a slightly saltier environment, and we've been at UNH for the past 15 years, and I'm a faculty member in ocean engineering and director of UNH's School of Marine Science and Ocean Engineering, and I often describe it as UNH's marine enterprise because it's broad and tangled and, um, and it extends across many units. I think that one of the best examples I can provide for our work in blue economy is the work that has been done and really pioneered by UNH's school uh, Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping. Now, now, how did they do that? We know that, that Larry Mayer and his team have mapped all over the world and Larry will often tell you how many days a year he has spent at sea, and it's a real point of pride. But he's done that because he's been an he and his team have been exceptionally good partners with NOAA. We are have the Joint Hydrographic Center, and we're re lo really looking forward to growing that relationship and some new exciting things to come. But also, he has over 40 different companies that he works with, and the idea is that every year, each of those companies maybe provides a bit of software or loans a piece of equipment out. And what that does is it allows them to stay connected to the workforce. 
Larry and his team at the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping, they invest in graduate education. Also graduate certificates. We know that the ocean is not, does not stop at our boundaries. And we also know that datum really matter. And so one of the things they did is they really pioneered a program with the Nippon Foundation where they have the DEBCO, the Generalized Bathymetric and Charting Program, where we have five to six students a year that come from all over the world so that we now know that our ocean mapping is connected across the planet. Okay, I think that that's really great. In recent years, they've actually, re we've really leaned in to the colleagues and, and friends. We need to think about how we work with that in coastal resiliency, where we work with the New Hampshire Coastal Adaptation Working Group, knowing that our town managers are on the front lines of climate change. Also working with um, Department of Energy and Economic Development Authority program involving marine renewable energy, so whirly gigs in the water, not in the air. And, um, and how that can actually potentially impact islanded communities. There are islands, physical islands, up and down the coast of Maine. We also know that many of our communities, whether they're inland in the mountains, are regularly islanded because of an unstable grid or a vulnerable grid. And how do we actually work with them to develop technology to make them more resilient? I think one of the other things I'd like to point out is um, we know that we have a $17 billion de seafood deficit every year. We also know that our fisheries, our natural fisheries, are, are really vulnerable to the change in climate that we're experiencing. So when we think about how we're going to feed a planet, whether that's here in the US or abroad, where we know that small island developing states, 70 to 90% of their protein source is fish, we know that we need to work with them and we need to listen to them as we're thinking about technology. And that includes how do we actually protect marine protected species like the right whale. And all of the, the things I've mentioned all have this really interesting and exciting pairing of engineers, engineering scientists with physical scientists and social scientists. And so our new Center for Sustainable Seafood Systems is actually leans into its partnership with NOAA's Office of Aquaculture and Milford Lab, as well as working with companies like Innova Sea here that are thinking about next generation aquaculture systems. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, so let's see, I, we've met all of our panelists now. I, I wanna dig in on a couple of uh, more specific topics. Um, so I think we've heard from uh, Administrator Finrad and in the conversation already, uh, many opportunities for new innovation that'll fuel the blue economy. But of course, I think one of our questions already from, uh, from the audience got at the other side of that, which is real concern and maybe growing concern about the impact on, on wildlife and, and their home. And so I get the question I'd like to start with, and, and uh, we're, we're gonna uh, let everybody have an opportunity to jump in that wants to, is what, what are your institutions doing to balance that? Balance fueling the economy with uh, protecting the fragile ocean environment? I think, you know, I mentioned well safe technologies. Our engineers are actually working on brittle lines that will snap really easily if they encounter a whale. But we also, uh, Dr. Spinrad also mentioned the importance of data and observation. So working with the Office of Naval Research, we're putting a new cabled array, offshore of Joel's Marine Lab, which um, will be a really important sort of gear to what's actually out there. And the idea is, can we do some early flagging? We've had conversations with MITRE, is it possible to actually sort of early flag vulnerability so that we can more dynamically adjust our practices. Uh, I'll jump in. Um, a, a couple of things. One is I think the interdisciplinary nature of this is critically important. So creating hubs, if you will, where you have people who are uh, areas of expertise in ocean engineering in wildlife management, in uh, marine biology, all of those things. We also have the Coastal Resource Institute and Center that's been very pivotal in terms of providing those balances. And then I think there are other opportunities that are going on. For example, uh, MITRE, we have collaborations with MITRE as well as others who are, are here. Um, on the Blue Nerve 
network, which is really important. And that brings together 11 different entities who are working together to have some shared resources, but also can connect with each other in real time, and that's really important to help advance things in an accelerated way. So um, I come from somewhat of a medical family. My wife is a physician and has other people in my family with medical backgrounds. And so part of the Hippocratic Oath is first do no harm. And so while I think technology and science can be and should be and has to be part of the solution space, as we talked earlier, I think it's also very important to have metrics pre-thought out so we can assess uh, a baseline before we start trying, before we mere humans try to start trying to help so we don't inadvertently cause damage, cause harm. So we need to understand what those uh, baseline conditions are so we can see and objectively assess if what we're doing is helping or not. And I think that's a very critical us uh, part, the humility part of that is really important for us to remember. And I, I think uh, to uh, the audience question earlier, that uh, understanding you know, the transparent ocean today and what is the current state in a way that we can explain publicly and avoid the myths and disinformation that, that Grant was making before he was here. And just a couple more things, I guess a, a maritime business like General Dynamics uh, attracts a lot of people who have a love for the sea. So a lot of our ploy employees um, are sailors, they're fisher, fishermen, um, and they spend a lot of time in maritime domains. So we inherently have an employee base that looks to protect the environment and protect the sea because they love it on a personal basis as well. Um, but the other thing is, I, I'd just like to add that um, stewardship of the environment and uh, economic prosperity are not necessarily uh, diametrically opposed, right? And so um, if you think about technologies that are necessary, uh, long-term batteries, right? Renewable energy from an a autonomous system perspective. Those, that's, a, that's the, um, um, the nirvana of, of undersea systems is to be able to have long duration capability out there. So, you know, companies like General Dynamics, we're investing in technologies that improve uh, sustainable energy. And it comes to a, a both benefit to the mission and benefit to the environment. So, you know, there are opportunities like that that make sense. And it's a win-win for both um, the environment and for business. Great, thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna since, since you mentioned your employees, let me pivot to a workforce topic. I, I mentioned earlier we'd get back to it. I, so we've got a great cross-section on the panel. We've got uh, certainly academic institutions, we have industry, we have some organizations, I think they're a little bit of both. Um, and so I guess from two perspectives, uh, to the employers, uh, are, you know, what are the challenges that you're running into in getting the right workforce to be able to develop the solutions and capabilities and, and keep pace with, uh, you know, the growth of the sector? And to the educational institutions, what are you doing to prepare uh, the, those those uh, young folks for the workforce? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll start. Um, we have clearly seen greater challenge at attracting and retaining employees, at least in our industry. So, you know, understand that it's not just the maritime domain and the blue economy for us, but it's the defense sector as well. And so, you know, part of it, um, the challenge for us with the, with the new generation coming in is showing folks and communicating to folks um, the cutting edge technologies that we're working on um, the fact that we're not, uh, you know, overly risk averse, right? That we understand how to take intelligent risk to look at uh, leading edge technologies, the partnerships with the universities and the, and the labs as well um, to allow them to innovate. So through the pandemic, we saw a fair um, amount of attrition and folks leaving, leaving the market. And we haven't really come back to where we are, and I think most of the industry has struggled to get back to where we were pre-pandemic. So our push has really been 
around that communication, starting it in middle school and high school in STEM programs, getting our employees out there in the, in the local environments, in the, uh, I'm sorry, the local communities uh, that we live in, getting uh, children hooked on science, and then carrying that through to our relationships with, um, with universities and developing an internship program where we build a relationship with students very early on in their collegiate career and bring them back uh, over and over so they get to meet our people, they get to understand the communities that we live in and what a vital part of those communities we are. They learn the technology and they uh, make a connection with the mission because for us in the defense sector, connecting with the mission and the importance of what we do, the fact that um, sailors depend on us for their safety, for their livelihood, right? And they're not just sailors out there. When our stuff doesn't work, we're putting someone's son, daughter, mother, father, wife, husband at risk, right? And making that connection uh, and having our workforce make that connection is one way that we get them passionate about what we're doing uh, and working on the innovative technologies that we're working on. I think also having those very tight connections with industry so that students can have that experiential learning uh, know what it's like to be out there uh, to actually do. But likewise, working with our industry partners as to are, do they have the skill set that they need and the education that they need? Are there things that you folks are seeing that are missing in working with the industry to know what are the needs because things do change over time? I, we also have to recognize that this generation of students have had been profoundly disturbed by COVID-19. And all the times and ways in which they would get messy, many of those ways were taken away from them. And so I would encourage everybody here to really think about how can you take on an undergraduate for two weeks in January? How can you take a summer internship? What are opportunities to get students out on boats, to get their feet wet and their hands dirty? This is something this generation of students needs. They have the interest, but they don't quite know what the next steps are. And so I think that that's one of the things that we can do. And you know, we, as a result, we've actually pushed the first year research experience into our physical sciences and engineering curriculum so that students are actually, I had students deploying sensors on Friday in response to Hurricane Lee, and that was, that was connected with a wood pole Britt Robbenheimer program through one of an NSF near. We need to get students out and getting them a little messy, and I think that's really important. Good. Um, first of all, the President's Rule, I'd like to thank you for coordinating. I think I hear sea lions or something barking in the back. Um, you don't hear that often on a panel. It kind of brings me back to my classroom days, to be honest with you. Um, in addition to what uh, my colleagues up here are talking about, um, I fully agree we need more technically trained people. We need, um, you know, who's going to be maintaining the wind turbines? Who's going to be um, getting hired by EB? Who's going to be doing, taking care of Larry's bricks um, and so on? But I also think, uh, given the scale and scope of the societal challenges, that we need more lawyers. You don't hear that often, but we need more doctors. We need more bankers and business folks from New England Council and other leading organizations to be very well trained in climate, to be very well trained in scientific literacy. So it, they're not just taking a course or two in college or even in high school or in graduate school, but these issues that we're discussing and debating are woven through their curriculum. So when Administrator Spinrad refers to the Patent and Trade Office, that five years from now, 10 years from now, people working at the Patent and Trade Office actually have part of their own training. They'll never be you know, oceanographers or ocean engineers, um, but they will have that baseline level. And I think it's incumbent upon us to really work with our colleagues to raise the overall level of science literacy, climate literacy, in addition to the, the technical workforces that we're talking about, because the technical workforces alone are not sufficient. 
we need to get that penetration uh, throughout society. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. So uh, I, I think we're seeing it in spades that just in the conversation that's already happening on the stage, but I wanted to turn to the topic of collaboration. Uh, and Rick, I think you just broadened it uh, beyond the, the uh, industry and academic folks here. Um, but I think we see it cuts across many sectors, the, the new blue economy does and needs to. And so um, can you speak about the importance of partnerships from your perspective uh, and maybe what, uh, what you're doing uh, to, to build those partnerships? I guess we all know there are smart people everywhere. And if we aren't looking outward to try and identify what opportunities are, we're probably not going to innovate as well as we could. And so we're really leaning into a variety of different partnerships. Universities have to adjust if we're thinking about the future and the challenges the country have. And the way we're going to do that is by working across boundaries, whether that's across institutions or across agencies or across industries. I would add, I mean, what better place to look at partnerships around a blue economy than New England with the amazing universities that we have uh, across all of our state, with the small businesses that have spawned out of those universities, that spawned out of the large businesses uh, that have a footprint here in, in New England. Um, so it's a, it's a great place to be to look to collaborate. Uh, for sure. And I said it earlier in my comments that around innovation, right? A, a large company like General Dynamics will likely not innovate across the spectrum of research to deployed product and productization, right? That takes the village. It takes the university doing the far end R side of things. It takes the lab moving that towards development and testing. And it takes businesses to, to figure out how to productize that and get it out to warfighters, right? So it really is a partnership, um, it, it, it needs to be a partnership when you're trying to tackle hard science problems. Um, I, would, I would also add that um, it, it, um, it's important that, um, as I said earlier, that we understand where our strengths are. And a lot of times it becomes a barrier to partnership, I think, when um, you know a big business may come in and say, no, 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 you don't understand university or you don't understand small business, right? Uh, each each um, participant in the partnership brings a strength to, to the table and understanding where those strengths lie is what really allows the magic to happen. So one of the things that we work really hard at at General Dynamics is letting everybody be themselves, bring their strength to the table and then figuring out how we turn that strength, those strengths collectively into an outstanding capability. So I, I think that matters a lot in partnerships as well. There's a saying that I really, I really like. It says, um, excellence is everywhere, but opportunity is not. And one of the biggest uh, impediments to opportunity are barriers. And in my world, from a somewhat institution of higher education, um, academic in addition to the technology side, uh, there's one of the biggest siloing is uh, really speaks down to our um, self-evaluation and career track. In academia, there's this phrase called alternative career, which drives me crazy, absolutely bat crazy, because that implies that you are successful if you get a PhD job at an academic institution, which we love academic institutions, but there are wonderful careers and they're not alternative careers. They're just careers. So we need to break down these barriers that really are deep in our culture, phrases such as alternative careers. So we are able to take advantage of those opportunities that indeed are everywhere, only limited by the creativity of the, the human mind to address these challenges. It's, a, it's, it's not only a tactical issue, but it's a strategic issue and it's a cultural issue. I would just add on to that, Bob, great comments. Um, 
the nature of boundary spanning and getting people outside of the silos and to really look at other areas. And, and one great way of couching it, if you will, is you're all looking to solve a problem together. Um, that is something that people can really rally around and coalesce around and do uh, versus, again, being in silos. Very good, all right. So, Dr. Spinrad gave us a challenge just a little bit ago, so you knew it was coming. Uh, and, and so maybe not in the vein of the entrepreneurial uh, guy 20 years ago who was just reselling your data, uh, but, but in, in the spirit of the new blue economy, uh, maybe comment about uh, the importance of data and, and, and examples of projects from each of your organizations where you see advancements that are going to lead to fueling the economy. I guess I think small and expensive sensors are one answer, um, meaning that people can design them to address a problem and now it's pretty easy to actually get that data back to somebody and be crowdsourced and, and citizen science. I'm also going to go at, at UNH, another program that I haven't talked about is we have a partnership with NASA and a grant from NASA to develop a geospatial satellite that will allow us to hover. We know when we think about harmful algal blooms that part of what we need to do is be able to watch it to evolve so that we can predict where it will evolve. One snapshot is not always enough. And so you can imagine going straight from satellite technology down to small handheld sensors. And we just have to be a little more creative and, and, and engage with the community. I, w I would just say the Blue Nerve network that we talked about before is a great example of bringing together you know 11 different entities where they can share data analytics uh, equipment things of that nature and again it is a, a great incubator if you will of accelerating science and tackling problems thank you i think as sensors become smaller less expensive more ubiquitous um, the problem gets back to what, what Dr. Spinner had said, um, data, right? There's just so much data. And what do you do with that to make it useful uh, versus overwhelming operators with, with a needle in a haystack problem, right? So um, how do you get better processing at the edge, at the sensor end of things, so that you synthesize that data to something that's more transmittable in a in a um, you know contested or a, or a, an environment that's not friendly to comms, how do you communicate that data over long distances uh, very uh, quickly? And then how do you get it back to uh, to a place where it can be then further synthesized into information? That whole value stream, uh, simplifying the problem space so you're not trying to dump huge amounts of data back from a sensor to a post processing site where it may take a day to get that data processed for somebody to make anything intelligent out of it, it is, is I think, um, a huge challenge right now. I have two answers. The first one's quick, which is uh, the data gathering through sensors of you know, large, small, whatever is needed, but getting it back to shore real time, real fast, so it can be uh, digested and then recycled and then used appropriately because the ocean is really big and it's really far away and it's really deep and you can't see it. So that's the technological answer. And there are a lot of people far smarter than I that are working on that and I'm very comfortable with continuing to have to do that. My, my real answer goes back to my cultural point in that I think we need to continue to break down these barriers and address the culture of what we do. And I ask you members of New England Council and with your colleagues in the businesses and so on to really help us create those opportunities. And the Northeastern University Co-op Program is a great example of how you're getting young college kids into your industries and getting them involved. Um, other programs like that, um, that really help merge and blur the boundaries um, what your folks are doing with Blue Nerve, as was said earlier, and the Blue Tech with the tank, working closely with academia to levels that hasn't been done before, um, at least in our sector. That's where I think we're going to be making the real progress. I've got great faith in, 
in the in the individuals, the people, to do what needs to be done. I have less faith in the institutions in terms of breaking down those um, historical and well justified um, at the time uh, structures, so they can be reactive and nimble in this modern era. Very good. Um, and thank you, by the way. I did not pay anybody to lift them up. Um, so, so let's see, and, and I think that highlights the importance of an events like this and the New England Council's mission in bringing together industry and academia and organizations like MITRE to help uh, break down those silos. Uh, of course, another part of New England Council's mission is uh, to think about federal policy. And certainly we have an ally in Administrator Spinrad, hopefully for five many more years. Um, but the question for the panel is, what more can the administration do? What more can Congress do uh, to, to help advance uh, the, the blue economy and the science in the space? And, and I wasn't sure I was going to do it. I'll throw it in there. And should we take anything that the, the White House dropped undersea technologies from the science and technology priorities for the nation about three weeks ago? <laughs> Where do you begin, huh? Um, well, let me let me uh, start with um, you know. To, first of all, we're very very grateful for um, the championing of, of the blue economy and things of that nature that certainly we have with with the spin rack. Um, I think that everybody is working very diligently right now, getting ready for uh, putting in applications to the new announcement. So that's good. One area that I think would be worth um, thinking about is are there new or different or innovative ways to help incentivize these partnerships, you know, between academia, between industry, between uh, other research institutes, uh, government agencies, you know, that, that could be put forward to, to help move this along in a more um, expeditious way. I agree. I, mean, I also think that um, most of the companies we talk with, one of the big limitations they will they will identify is permitting and environmental impact assessment. And um, we know that's critically important because we don't want to make a decision. We don't want to take a move that's going to have a detrimental, unintended impact. But we are in a litigious society where we're often afraid to innovate because we're afraid of lawsuits. And I'm not sure I'm supposed to say that with my title, and so don't record that. But I, I think it's really important that we think about how do we how do we work with the federal agencies to streamline the permitting process? How do we identify paths forward? Most companies will say that they have the idea, they have the technology, and actually being able to get things in the water takes three times longer than they, they think it should. Our scientists say that also. I'll um, quickly answer, answer part of your question, Doug. Um, I'm not sure about the administration's priorities, but if they manifest themselves in the defense budget, um, undersea technology is still a key factor for the Navy, a key investment area for the Navy based on uh, again, the emerging threat of China and what's happening in indo uh as well as, you know, Russia and, and their maritime capability. So, um, at least in that part of the budget, the administration is still very strong in terms of the importance of undersea dominance for our country. To quickly follow up on that, I will also want to remind this community that the uh, investments in the Navy have tremendous dual-use impact on non-Navy research as well. For example, power supply. Um, if the Navy is flying things around under the ocean to you know, look at X, Y, or Z, they need better batteries, longer lifespan, better power management algorithms. That serves the, the NOAA community and the academic community you know, equally well. So there's a real big dual use here between, uh, between, between what we're doing up here. Um, you mentioned the word Congress, which is you know, an interesting word. Just real straightforward, if Congress could pass a budget on time, would be tremendous help for uh, all the agencies so they could uh, plan better. <laughs> I, 
I can say that. Um, but I mean, it truly is an important uh, consideration um, because as we all know, if you can't plan, then you really have your hands tied. And to that end, I would say that, okay, I am eternally grateful to be in the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts and bordered by Rhode Island and New Hampshire and the New England, um, other states, uh, because we definitely do have a value system in our government level um, that aligns with the environment and, and uh, technological development and so on. But I also urge the business leaders in this room to not take it for granted and to continue to show your support to our elected officials because they need to hear from their friends as well as other folks who are trying to provide them, I'm looking at Lauren here, who knows this field very, very well, um, you know, try, and Joe, you're trying to provide them with, you know, uh, information that might be out of their wheelspace. We have very strong delegations in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, and it's very important that they continue to hear from you and to continue to hear what works. Um, uh, so it's not just coming from academia or it's not just coming from defense industry and so on, but it's coming from you folks who are the business leaders that are very much part of the fabric and driving the economic engine of this New England region. Please keep up that messaging to them because it benefits us all. Great, thank you. Uh, I think we have a few minutes for audience questions. Okay, one or two questions from the audience. Hi, I can compete with the seals just from here. Um, so I'm with the British consulate and I know that we have great relationship with UNH uh, and URI. Uh, and I was just wondering, you talked about you know, excellence is everywhere. Um, maybe talk a little bit about the breadth of the international uh, community engagement that you've had in order to bring in perhaps skills or expertise that we haven't managed to find locally. In our mapping community um, and our Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping, we have industry partners that span the globe. And certainly and numerous in Canada, um, we map all over the world. I think the JEBCO program that I mentioned where we're training six students a year is really important. Our aquaculture group has really started to make progress with multi-trophic aquaculture systems and more along the lines of the the engineering science, so we're actually working at deploying some of our systems at three different places around the planet with the idea that the fish and the shellfish and the mussels may change, but the idea is that they locally positively impact the ocean acidification. Certainly our Center for Acoustics Research and Education pairs the, and that's an ONR supported program, pairs the passive acoustics that are across the planet as well. So I think most of us here can speak to the fact that the ocean doesn't respect boundaries and um, we do our best to, to, to blend that boundary. Great, thank you. And time for one more question. Can I answer that question though too, as well, if I may? First of all, when you asked for questions, I was momentarily terror stricken because my daughter is in the audience and I was really glad that she didn't stick her hand up to ask me a, a question. <laughs> Sorry, Abigail. Uh, to, to answer your question, I, I'll say that in some ways it's easier to collaborate internationally at times than it is you know, internally. I just returned from a delightful trip um, to British Columbia where I was part of the Innovate Canada team. And you know, so there's, you know, Canada has hotbeds of ocean tech and ocean innovation, um, you know, all over British Columbia, Halifax, St. John's, you know, and so on, and Southampton in the UK, and Bremen over in Germany, and so on. So I, I actually think that in many ways, the um, international collaboration is easier because while there are barriers, there are more systems in place to overcome those barriers. Whereas sometimes internally we're making it up on the fly or it's too personality dependent as opposed to structural. Thank you, Rick. I think uh, 
that probably concludes the panel for today. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank uh, Doug, and I want to thank the incredible uh, panelists. I want to thank uh, uh, the good doctor for making the trip here. I want to thank uh, our host here, uh, who has done an extraordinary job uh, here, Vicki Squirrel. She has really put the aquarium on the map as one of the gems here in New England, as well as Mystic. Mystic is too. Mystic is right here. We're very diplomatic here at the New England Council. Uh, we love both. And uh, all of you, thank you very much for making the effort to be here today. I think you can all agree it was very educational, very informative, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you at uh, the next New England Council.